We have arrived at our final panel, and here we are going to hear from three executives from three major companies on how they used automation to solve problems and, ex and improve the experiences of their workforces. Now, interesting to note, as I was preparing for this, all of these companies have innovated massively, but these are not young techs. These are all legacy companies. I don't have to explain to you who they are. Mass Mutual founded in 1851, GE founded one year later in 1852, and MasterCard is the relative baby on this stage, <laughs> founded in 1966. In the first panel, they had ladies first. I decided to put age before beauty. Age of the company. So I'm going to start with you, Sears, because we know you're not that old. Um, how does a 171-year-old mutual introduce automation? Uh, very carefully. Um, <laughs> you know, we, when, when we introduced automation at, at the company, we, we took a data-driven, uh, data science-centric approach. Um, and we pulled back and looked across uh, what we think of as the policyholder life cycle and thought about where are those moments or, or those key points in a, in a business process or a policyholder experience that are going to lead to the most impact, whether that's top line, bottom line, or again from a digital perspective, um, just making it easier to, to, to do business with us. Um, so that, that's how we started, um, was, was really just pulling back and, and saying where can we make the most impact and then turning that into a strategy. Nick, similar question to you. Perhaps on this stage, your company, GE, has transformed the most, and it's about to transform again, in that it will be three companies. Mm -hmm. So how are you using automation to help in that very difficult process? There's a lot of work that goes on in a company of our age, and what I would say is it starts with a mindset and a culture. And so for us, we really embrace lean as a way of thinking about waste elimination. And once you put yourself in that mindset, everything else starts to really fall into place. And then it really is about using the technology as an enabler to make people's jobs more interesting and to get them out of the mundane work that they're doing every day and elevate them. And so we look at this as a, a mindset, but also taking technology and deploying it to advance the mission that we have at hand. Joanne with MasterCard, of course, you implement AI to help improve the experiences of your workforces. But you do something else that is of concern to a lot of people that don't understand this. You are charged with building the ethical outlines around AI in your company. Yep. Can you give us an example? Sure. So when you think about us as the baby on the panel, um, we've been a data company for quite a while. We um, you know, make transactions safe, simple, and secure no matter what type they are. And so when you think about um, our use of AI for fraud, for example, and how we have to monitor all sorts of data across our globe and our network that we operate, we also have to think about are we using AI in a way that is ethical or responsible as we think about the types of data sources that we're using. Is the data accurate? Is it of good quality? Is it the right information? Is the data sets that we're using, are they biased in some way so that we might get to the wrong answer? So we have to look for bias in the data that we're using. We have to look at bias in the analysis and the analytics and the algorithms that we're creating. So we need a diverse workforce, right, and lots of different perspectives as we come up with those two pieces of the AI methodology. And then we have to look at the output. And we always are doing this, really looking at those outcomes because they're always going to be, at some level, very individually impactful, right? Even though we're a B2B company, all of our products and solutions really impact all of you as our cardholders, right? And through our banks and customers. So we need a process, and that's what we've put together is an AI governance process, and it really takes everybody from our data designers and data quality experts all the way through to our data scientist community, and then all the way through to our customers as we think of the ecosystem of AI as it gets deployed. Because once AI gets deployed, it begins to learn from itself. And so you really need to make sure that you're really creating AI that's responsible and really thinking through these issues so that when it begins to learn from itself, it's learning the right things, not the wrong things from all the inputs that you create. Sears, you had referenced the range of business that you do. I want to remind people, of course, you are an insurance company. You also uh, do a range of insurance policies, financial planning. You have annuities. Unless anyone think you are old school, you are a major player in the development of the Boston Seaport. And the company was recently very public about investing 
in crypto, as your chairman recently told me. You manage a lot of data. How does AI make all of that data easier for you to manage? Yeah, I think you know we, we think about data management, data protection, and, and how we put AI on top of that data. Um, again, um, to deliver the, the biggest impact to policyholders, um, whether that's through a better experience, um, a better price for a product, what, what have you. Um, so we, we do that from a, a marketing perspective, whether that's increasing our ability to convert policyholders from, from particular campaigns, um, speeding up the time it takes to actually underwrite a policy. Some of you may, may have bought, bought a policy in, in the recent past and it had an experience where it, it took weeks uh, maybe to get that done. Um, at Mass Mutual, that, that takes minutes at this point. And that's all sitting on top of the power of, of AI and our data science models, and most importantly, our data. All right. Nick, you referenced being lean yeah. as a way to improve your workforce, but on this stage, you are the largest company, yeah. I believe. Your workforce is still over 200,000 globally. How do you use automation to manage so many people in so many places? It's a great question, Janet. I'll give you two examples, uh, one from internal in the enterprise and one external in the customer base. On the internal side, it does start with that lean mindset and culture. And one of the things we did last year was we sponsored a waste walk week. And we sat with our functions, 1,400 associates, and we asked them to look at the work that they do, the outcome that they deliver, and how can we either simplify or automate that work? And just in the course of a week, we eliminated over 25,000 non-value added hours. And this was something that our CFO, myself, we co-champions. The second example is on the customer side where customers in our energy business have outages. Outages should be planned, but they could be unplanned. And when they're unplanned, they hurt. And so we looked at that process, the entire value stream of the process, from material flow to customer calling to field rep deployment, and we leaned it out and we used digitization in the field to help shrink the cycle time by 30%. So these things can drop to the bottom line, it just takes some mindset and some technology to help activate them. We've been talking today so much about workforce shortages and the problems of hiring people, I have not spoken to a single executive over this past year who has not had that problem. Is there anyone here <laughs> who does not have open positions and has had no problem hiring? Okay, so Joanne, <laughs> let's dig into that with you because you say that you use AI through the entire employee life cycle. So first to attract them and then more importantly to retain them. How do you do that? Sure, so um, I think this was discussed from uh, many perspectives so far today, but I think we're all facing the challenge of attracting the next generation of workforce. And it is a challenge, but I think many of us are coming to understand that we have to look at the whole person of our employees, and we really need to think about the next generation of workers. And I think one of the previous conversations focused on first, are we looking for the right set of skills, right? So I think we've started to use AI to really look at our position descriptions, right? Um, are we asking for too much, right? Do we really need all these degrees, number one, in every single job description for a technologist, for a data analyst, for a data scientist? What do we really need in each job? Have we been asking for too much? So we've looked, we first used AI to actually look at our job descriptions and say, what do we need and where are we also looking? I mentioned the need for diverse talent. We also need a diversity of perspectives. We've just been through a very significant time change with COVID, right? And understanding that we need diverse perspectives if we're going to create the products and solutions for the next generation. We've been talking about automation. We just talked about the metaverse. All of the next generation of products and solutions need diverse perspectives as we begin to merge digital and physical worlds. So why wouldn't we want individuals who have that gaming background to help us think through how does that metaverse merge with the physical world, right? So making sure that you attract young talent into your company as well as mature talent and experienced talent is really important. So looking for the right profiles as you're bringing together new teams, we're using AI to actually create the teams of the future. So that's part of our talent attraction strategy as well as, of course, looking at where, do we, where are we sourcing our talent. I know a lot of organizations were trying to attract more and more diverse talent around the globe from different universities like HSBUs, uh, um, you know, historically black colleges, 
um, different organizations so that we can understand um, what kind of talent is out there that we haven't maybe historically attracted. But on the retention front, we also are going through a time of great change in the workforce, right? And all of us have been talking about that. And we've also started asking our employees, what is it that you want in the employment now? And so we've started to do things, not only kind of flexible schedules, but we've started doing things like um, a, a, a flexible work opportunity of four weeks from work from anywhere. So we can give our employees the opportunity to not only take their vacation time, but if they need that extended time with their families over the summer, work at the lake house, work at the beach house, work from the mountains if you want, because we know that it works, right? We've been working from anywhere. We also give, um, we've been using AI to create um, what we call, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I have it right, unlocked, which is a training opportunity for you to uh, pursue different paths in the company. So if you're in legal right now, but you wanna do a stint in technology or an audit, you have a chance to do that. And then we also have a cultural health index that helps us look at our company from the outside in and the inside out. And we're using AI to really enrich the data that we're using to actually assess ourselves as we try to figure out what does employment look like into the future? So those are some of the ways we're doing it. We are going to have to huddle with Mandeep to figure out how your employers are going to work remotely from their beach house in the metaverse. I, I know, like to I know. The out. metaverse is I a whole other conversation. It, I, I agree. I, an, an I agree with goggles and the headsets and the, and the whole bit, but they already are, some of that's already happening, but there's more to come for sure. So we're watching companies having to put much more effort to attract employees to attract customers, seers. I think having a policy underwritten in five minutes is a great way to attract customers. But how else are you using automation to attract customers and make sure they are getting what they need from your company? Yeah, so what, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about that problem. Um, so kind of starting at the top of the funnel, right? What we're really trying to do is find people that are interested in our products and services at the right time. And once we do that, we want to introduce them to those services through the right channel of engagement that, that they're most likely to uh, want to engage in in the first place, whether that's digital or talking to uh, an advisor. So we've built out a, a pretty comprehensive platform that enables our marketing and, and field uh, ambassadors and, and advisors to, to take advantage of those capabilities. We've got AI systems kind of, again, at the, the top of the funnel that speed up our ability to run marketing campaigns and, and do that demand generation. Once we've done that, we then have algorithms and, and systems that we use to match those uh, potential policyholders with advisors and products and services that, that they're most likely to uh, want to purchase. So it's been, uh, it's been a long journey, but, but it's uh, had some tremendous impact for our policyholders. Thank you so much. Nick, uh, like Mass Mutual and perhaps even more so, you have such a wide range of businesses that sit under GE. This is sort of an open question. Are there certain problems that you use AI, you had to use AI to fix that wouldn't have been fixed any other way? You know, we have a lot of diverse data in the company, much like the other two colleagues sitting next to me. And what I would say is that a lot of it comes down to information that runs our supply chain, our factories, so that we can give people insight into purchasing, but then also on the operational side, how do we do better forecasting? And so a lot of what we use AI and automation for is quite frankly to take work that the humans that our analysts and, and associates were doing and try to really instill that in the organization and bring them up. And so a lot of what we talk about is the fact that we want to make work fun more. Like we, we want people to do the work that's interesting to them. So how do we deploy these technologies to either provide visibility into forecasting, into SNOP, into supply chain, so that we can then have people really focus on the challenging questions at hand, running our businesses and really thinking about the next several years. I want to ask all three of you a question, and just a heads up, I'll start with you, Joanne, first, because work has changed so much in the last two years. We were talking about catching up to the French with that 35-hour <laughs> work week or the four-day work week, but, but in reality, everyone has gone more remote, except 
for perhaps television and radio anchors. <laughs> um, so how do you use AI to help people feel connected to your companies? Because you are not actually seeing them in person the way that we are delightfully seeing each other today. So Joanne, let me start with you first. Some of the new things that you had to implement in the last two years to keep your workforce connected and, and working you know, optimally together. So I think we have seen a great transformation. And I think early days, I think everybody tried those Zoom happy hours. Anybody for a Zoom happy hour? No, not so much anymore, right? I think everybody tried that. We tried so many different uh, remote activities. I did a cooking class with my team remotely. We did a murder mystery remotely, right? Um, and so there are ways to do things remote that are still somewhat fun. But I would argue that um, coming back together is still a whole lot more fun to build culture. And so we are back in the office a couple of days a week. And what we're being asked to do as leaders is find ways to get your team together so that the best of hybrid, which is really what we're really about right now, um, can really happen. And so we are having get-togethers, but the, the idea is to have meaningful time together because um, the harder part is in a two-day or three-day work week when you're in person, you don't have your whole team together. And I think that's the challenge of the now. So what we're trying to do at MasterCard is we've asked leaders to come up with the reasons for teams to be together for a purpose, right? Not just for an offsite meeting, but for me as a data officer, we do a lot of data flow charts, right? And so do, we have found that, yes, you can use lots of different tools to do it remotely, but it's a whole lot more fun to do the whiteboarding together. So when we have design sessions, we actually bring people in and we bring people together. And then we actually then broadcast those sessions, we record them, and then we send them out to the team. And so that is actually another way to then engage our partners because then other colleagues will show that at a meeting and then we get their reactions. And so then what we do is we then can bring people in to begin to kind of snowball that. But I do think we're at a really cultural moment of how do we get people to stick together, be together, and then also really bring them in for the reason that we all like to work, which is those serendipitous moments of, oh, I just saw you and I forgot that I need to talk to you about this project because it would be fabulous if we could innovate together. And it's that innovation moment that I think we have to figure out that isn't the scripted, oh, I need 30 minutes on your calendar. And I think that's where we're still working on that. I don't know that I have the answer for the, everybody in the room. Nick, you already had a workforce that was all over the place, so you maybe had a head start in that. But again, with the pandemic, with so many different businesses and teams, again, that really had to connect in order to move forward, are there things that you also introduced in the last two years? Ours, um, ours is almost multi-layered. So there are two or three layers. What I'd say at the foundational layer, we had to transition 200,000 from office to field or home. And that took everything from infrastructure to a view of cyber to networks to capabilities. As you moved up the stack, software and connectivity that helped people do their work. But then really the third one, which was I think the big, biggest accelerator was the mindset that all of our employees had to take where the pandemic forced them into a accelerated evolution. It forced them into a world where they had to ultimately work in a virtual environment. And so when I, you take those three layers, what we found is that our employees rose to the challenge and much like Joanne, I mean, they, they figured the way to work out and now we're getting back into that mode. But I would tell you is that the pandemic, some good things did come out of it as we think of the accelerants in digital technology. Nick, uh, Sears, very interesting. Uh, your company had planned a massive new headquarters here in the seaport before the pandemic. And I say co-headquarters because you're still formally yep. headquartered in Springfield. And I remember again talking to your chairman about the challenge of designing this very expensive building, breaking ground, having it built during the pandemic. And then him saying, similar to what Joanne had referred to, that it has now become a destination mm -hmm. for your employees because you are everywhere. And this will still be a way to connect physically in the future. So instead of being tethered to this place every day, yeah. you actually come with excitement to meet other people. But that being said, you already had the challenge of employees split between two places in Massachusetts, including people everywhere else. So I wanna ask you the same question about some of the things that you did to ensure that people stayed connected within Mass Mutual during these very challenging last two years. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we like everybody, um, we, we had to act quickly. Um, so I, I think that the good news was uh, we realized as an organization that we were already um, hybrid and we just didn't know it. We had people <laughs> 
in offices all over the world. I mean, we, we've got a couple, obviously, in, in Massachusetts, but, but we're, a, we're a global company. Um, so what we realized was we had a lot of the, the core capabilities and, and technologies um, at our fingertips. Teams just had to really think about how to use them purposefully and productively as, as we were oper operating remotely. Um, and then as, as we get closer to um, today and thinking about living in, in this hybrid world, I think the comments um, that Joanne made earlier around connecting with purpose um, were, were so spot on. I think getting people um, in a room, a conference room, you know, a, a setting like this, um, and really making them be purposeful with what they want to get out of those discussions is what brings people back to the office. And we've actually seen some, some really great transformation uh, just at, down at our Seaport office and, and out in Springfield as well um, when, when we do that. Um, the big challenge now is how do we actually make the physical environments um, of our buildings look and feel as productive as the virtual ones um, that we're now currently used to operating in over these last two years. So we're thinking about how to use AI technologies or, or just enabling new features in, in telecommunication software, camera software, and, and other collaboration tools. We are sadly down to my final question. And sir, you asked such great questions, but I, we're going to have to ask it personally after this because I'm running out of time. There is something that I wanted to ask all three of you. Again, I introduced you as working for legacy companies. You are also not new employees at your company. You have been there for mm -hmm. a long time, which means when you all join your companies, the terms AI and automation were never came <laughs> up in a discussion, and also your positions did not exist not even as an idea. So again, I want to ask all of you, starting with Joanne, how did you upscale as your company had to upscale? Oh, wow. Um, that, that's a great question. So um, it's interesting, right? Um, MasterCard has been on a transformation journey ever since I joined the firm. Um, I joined the firm as the first chief privacy officer, actually, um, because the firm wanted to start using data as a form of innovation and they wanted to do it in a responsible manner and they knew that there were laws out there that they needed to comply with. And I joined at um, pretty much at the same time as our former CEO, uh, Ajay Banga, and we had lots of conversations about how do we do this, how do we service, uh, Key Bank is in the room um, and many of our banks um, are in the room and how do we do that in a way that's going to kind of foster the data innovation that was going to be needed by so many of our uh, banks and then ultimately merchants and governments and, and others. And so um, it's been a journey, I think. I don't think I could have foreseen the need for the CDO, but as we were going through things like all of the compliance that is now out there with data and innovation, what happened was I was building the systems as the privacy officer and I kept saying, you know, we really need somebody in charge of data. And everybody kept patting me on the head and saying, <laughs> yeah, 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 we do. Um, and little did I know they were going to say, yes, you should do that job. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes innovation occurs all around you and I do like to build new things. And so I think for uh, what I do tell um, people who work for me and other colleagues is that no skill set ever goes to waste. Uh, we are living in amazing times where all sorts of new things are going to happen and we've been talking about AR and um, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality. And I think even those things are going to help us in the workforce of the future and how we all work together and interact. And so just keep learning. Um, I had a mentor once tell me, work at the margins of your ignorance and you will never go wrong, meaning always learn more. And yeah. so that's from Harvey Golub. Um, and so I share that with all of you. I recently interviewed one of the co-founders of Ginkgo Bioworks, and she said, I am super qualified for my job a year ago. Yeah, that that's works. That's how I always yeah. feel. That works for me. learning, <laughs> catching up, and I'm super qualified. Work at the margins of your ignorance. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's about right. <laughs> Nick, you have held a lot of positions at GE. I have. I've been probably at GE since 1999. I say it starts with um, a purpose, a passion, and then prioritization. And the reality is, is like, GE is an amazing company. The purpose of helping to cure, empower, and transport people around the world is one that just motivates me and has continued to evolve throughout the last 20, 25 years. I'd say the passion is the people and the products are one that really energize and excite you, but it's really the prioritization. I think if you take any one thing, you can break it down into something which is manageable and deliverable. And I think that's where automation comes in. If you take it and make it a priority to make people's jobs better, you can get it done. Sears, working at a 171-year-old company, we know you were not there in the <laughs> beginning days. So how did you finally upscale yourself?
to keep up with the innovation you need to do in order for a company like Mass Mutual to stay relevant? Yeah, you know, I, I think for, for me and, and my team and, and really the, the rest of the organization, I, I think the comments around operating at, at, your, uh, at, at the margins of ignorance is, is really insightful. Um, for us, it's being strategic about where those margins are. So what, what are the skills um, that we think we need to acquire, whether as an individual, a leader, teams, that are going to benefit the policyholder, benefit the company, help us compete more effectively? Um, we do that every day, right? We ask those kinds of questions um, a, as a team and then turn those into actions that, uh, again, we either take as, as leaders or that we offer to our employees um, to, to grow themselves. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed this conversation.